Stories and Sketches of Lancashire Life by Ben Briley, the Failsworth Poet. First published in 1864 by Abel Awood & Sons, Oldham Street, Manchester. No, to Marlock is to play or mess about. Narrated by Malt Cowell. Marlock's of Meryton. Episode 1. The Boggart of Fairy Bridge. Do you know Meryton, reader? Not at all. You shake your head as if you doubted there being such a place. Oh well, have your own no, as a Meritonian would have said. Call me dreamer if you like, but I would not part with my recollections of what Meryton was thirty years ago for as much of your flimsy modern philosophy as it were possible to cram beneath the most capacious of beavers. No, no. Hang up that article, as Romeo would have said, had he been a Meritonian, and give me the ringing laughter, the sound sleep, and the unwalked conscience of that happy place and period, where Banting would have been lynched had he dared to preach leanness, and Christianity took that muscular form which developed itself in weekday jollity and Sabbath heart-worship when edge-backings were laced with blackberry brambles and footpaths were not stopped by greedy landowners, when cans chinked at the well and the broad village green bottled round its cheap delights in pictures of own brood, innocent of any notion of inebriety. Yes, give me back Meryton thirty years ago and take all my share of modern frippery in return. Take away my broadcloth my elastic sides and fast life, and restore me to my corduroys, my clogs, my cold turnip and contentment. Reader, if it were possible to roll back the wave of time, as some long-necked Parnassian has said, I would enjoin it to recede a distance of thirty years, and with younger looks and younger feelings than our present, you need not smile. All your philosophy hath not yet taught you to prefer age to youth. We would journey together to Meryton. Do you say it is possible? In our imagination it may be. And that you are willing to bear me company? Very well, I'll take you at your word. So come along. My foot is on my native heath once more, barring that there are two inches of solid owler intervening betwixt the two. The sixth patch on my trousers' knees is showing signs of a disposition to follow its predecessors. There is but one button of an isthmus to connect the two continents washed by a sea of shirt at my waist, and my frill is at the very last stage of limpness and obedience to pins. My cap, but stop, that was a luxury I had no acquaintance with at the time. My hair, I ought to have said, is filled with hayseeds and well besmeared with treacle, and I am in nervous anticipation of a whipping. Never mind, it is worth a blister or two to have been an old wop's haymo, to have discovered the slightest of birds' nests secreted beneath a snowstorm of hawthorn blossom, and to have made such rings on the river's surface as were never made but by childish feet. You see the bridge there? its timbers shaky and rotten, and only awaiting a more copious flood than common to sweep it down the river, if you don't find my initials, and such initials too, carved on the railing, vandalism has been at work. Ah, here they are. D for Dolmy, and T for Turting Tower. My name, sir. They don't make knives nowadays such as the one employed in that carving. I remember the knife well. It had lost its spring and a portion of its haft before it came into my possession, and the blade was worn into the form of a hook. God forgive me for my inhumanity, but I swapped a bird's nest containing four young ones for it, four gaping chelopers that cried for their absent parent and the expected meal of worms, alas, long looked for, but never to come. When I see a group of children in the street crying for their mother, I think of that bird's nest and sigh over the remembrance. We are now in Meryton. The river divides it from Hazelworth, which is almost such another village, though not quite. I am glad it is summer, for nature hath lavished her beauties on Meryton, and they are now in their prime. 
Look at that orchard there, where many a time I have climbed to pluck the delicious fruit. No, never surreptitiously. Were it possible to dream of a gasworks being erected there, that the fragrance of those blossoms would ever be exchanged for the stink of lime fell with tar, or that their beauty would be supplanted by clouds of steam and wreaths of the blackest smoke, my heart sickens at the prospect, distant as it may appear. How gracefully the willows rest their branches on the bosom of the still water, and how proudly the roses peep down and look at their mirrored selves, making two bowers out of one. I have often waded in the stream to pluck those roses, and as often sighed to think that I had spoiled the picture their presence made. Well might the poet say, A thing of beauty is a joy for ever, since beauty was then a joy to me, as I hope it may be now. Ah, why do we seek to destroy it? They say he is a benefactor who makes two blades of grass grow in the place of one, and I am sure he is equally a benefactor who converts a waste into a garden instead of a garden into a waste. If even if you look at it from a utilitarian point of view, it is still the same, since beauty means health and sweetness and enjoyment, what the soul desires most, happiness. Did you observe that something dart through the water with the swiftness of a shuttle? It was a trout. The river abounds with that dainty fish, but they were ever beyond the reach of sport. Often have I angled for them with emp and line and pinook, baiting with a worm, but never had the satisfaction of taking anything of greater piscatorial value than an unwary jack sharp or a deluded miller's thumb. That pool there, where the water makes a circle before flowing over the shallow, was once thought to be the haunt of a river deity, an enemy to naughty children named Grindy Loaf. We were all frightened of this monster, and avoided the pool as much as possible when evening came. He had often been seen, it was asserted, with his shoulders raised above the water, and in the act of bringing his streaming locks, as a swabber does his mop, and grinding his teeth, as if longing for the bones of some disobedient urchin, then undergoing the penalty of flagellation, for preferring the bright green fields to the dusky, unwholesome school. It was said of him also, that he was fond of good children, and such as he got into his power, he would make fairies of, who live forever in green leafy dells, and fly about like moths at eventide, and drink honeydew out of cups made of flowers, and dance in the moonlight to the strange you sometimes hear, when earthly silence lets unearthly music come streaming through it. One time a little child was found floating in that pool, and the jury who sat upon it were within a vote of bringing in the verdict, killed by Grindy Loaf, but years and a guilty conscience-stricken mother made another verdict easy to be arrived at. That was a blot upon Meryton, and when people converse about it, they speak in whispers, as if they were afraid heaven might be listening. But come with me a little farther. What makes you pause? That beauty, yonder, airing her charms in the sun, that is Matty Charlesworth, the prettiest, sauciest jade in the whole of Meryton. The gossips predict of her that she will come to no good, but then gossips are always predicting something of somebody, and mostly it wide of the mark. They are not such as Matty who fall the easiest prey to villainy. They are the modest, the unsophisticated, the confiding, whom the vicious seize upon and destroy, and therefore makes not the rustle of the autumn leaf in that world, by whom virtue shall be protected, not ensnared. I will tell you a story about Matty when we sit down. There is a snug little alehouse round the corner of the lane there. Don't be shocked. It's not one of your gym palaces where people burn their lips till they are blue with liquid fire and nightly go sotting home like a heap of filthy rags. It is a sweet, wholesome little place. You need not have what you are pleased to call drink, unless you are so inclined. You can have a cup of milk, and such milk too, as you don't get from a two-wheeled cow after it is partaken of its usual libation at the pump. 
Indeed, the place smells more like a dairy than an alehouse. Here it is. What? You cannot see the signboard? I don't wonder at that. It's so hidden among the ivy and jasmine. When you get opposite the door, you may then behold the face of a jolly carter, peeping out from his verdant stable, as he is in the act of raising a pot towards his lips, which never gets any nearer, as if he was suffering from perpetual thirst, the quenching of which was doomed to be perpetually deferred. Listen, there is no noise within. The house is as quiet as an empty school, save now that there is the hum of a clock just striking the hour. Not one of your flimsy skeletons of clocks, that require as much attention as a refractory engine, but a faithful, unobtrusive, sober-minded, steady-going case clock, that was made before the era of trumpery, and intends lasting till trumpery has had its day. Enter! Do you wonder now that on Saturday evenings the song and jest should pass round the room, when industry has loosened its traces and feels frisky? Do you wonder that nobody can pass by the house when they hear the merry laugh behind the window curtains, but turn in, call for their jill, and when they rise to go home express their astonishment that the hour should be so late? Do you wonder now that in their earnestness to reclaim the will from the sin of drunkenness, such little notes should have a charm in the eyes of some of these reformers, that blots them out of their scheme, as the smile of a sometimes mischievous child saves it from chastisement. No, I say you don't. In this house, once, I am coming to the story about Matty Charlesworth, in this house, a few years ago, there lived a fine old landlady. The one who had just served us is no bad specimen. Grandmother to the saucy beauty who so recently attracted your notice. I remember her very well. She had grace and music and motherly expression in her every movement. The very sand loop refreshed after she'd trod upon it, and the motion of her arms, always bare to the elbows, seemed to be guided by a spirit whose duty it was to watch over domestic comfort. You should have seen a roll of muffin on a baking day. You would then have deemed it worth your while to get into Parliament, on purpose to introduce a bill for the total abolition of public bakehouses. Had you tasted one of those muffins, you would have kicked the next baker you had met and bidden him seek more fitting employment. There was a sort of matronly conservatism expressed in the very manner in which she dusted the rolling board previous to laying on the dough. You could not have induced her by any means to change the method of doing it, if it would even have saved her ever so much time. She used no duster, as modern housewives do, the degeneracy of the sex, but taking the flower in her hand, she would riddle it through her fingers with such a measured indifference to time, that I do not marvel at her living to a good old age. After rolling the paste to the required thinness, she would take it on her palms and place it in the oven, as carefully as if she were putting a delicate child to bed. Then, when the muffin was baked and it came out of the oven smiling, with crisp brown cheeks setting off a deep white dimple in the centre, and the edges as even as the rim of a cup, and all looking so rich and wholesome, if you had not felt hungry at the sight of it, I should have pitied the condition of your liver. It was quite a picture to see the array of such muffins placed edgeways on the dresser, and contemplated very longingly by a number of hungry boys through the window and doorway, who, as they counted them and speculated as to their probable worth at shop quotations, wished all kinds of extravagant wishes, in which the possession of loads of muffins and mugs of treacle would most likely predominate. Matty Charlesworth was not like her grandmother at all. She had ways of her own, as the latter would sometimes say, and these were not of that amiable kind which partook so largely of the old dame's character. Matty was rarely in a good temper. Wherever she happened to be, it might have been fairly calculated on that someone was going to have the worst of it, for she was a limb at mischief and if you'd heard her silvery laugh come ringing from the vicinity of the fout yay, you might have felt sure that the devil were abroad. But Matty had some good womanly qualities in her nature for all that. 
She was as clean, hard-working, and ready-fingered a lass as any in Meryton. The clink of her patterns as she cleaned the house on a morning was sure to call the neighbours out of bed and make them wonder that they had slept so long. Her newly washed clothes were always first on the hedge, and anyone who wanted a holiday shirt making and wished it to excel all others in the fineness of its needlework and the neatness of its fit was certain to stammer out a request to Matty that she would undertake it. Notwithstanding her hasty and flighty temper, Matty was a wonderful disposer of that condiment called by the rustics, gawk seed. What? You don't understand the term? Well, gawk seed is the embodiment of that species of admiration which is more fascinated by outward show than by inward worth. You buy it when you sit drinking for hours together on purpose to stare at a pretty barmaid. You buy it when you go shopping if you pay more attention to the oily tongue and oily locks of the shopman than to the quality of his wares. You buy it of the quack fibbing in the marketplace when he persuades you that his scented pills will cure all diseases incident to humanity. The penniless tradesman sells it when he dazzles your eyes by the splendour of his bankrupt establishment. The clergyman, who impresses his congregation more by the get-up of his person than by the eloquence of his tongue or the quality of his sermon, sells it. The poor aristocrat, trading on his pedigree, sells it. And the ambitious mother, who frequents balls and assemblies, and with her eye bids you admire the figure and gait of her daughter, as you would the symmetry and pace of a blood daughter, speculates largely in this wonderful kind of merchandise. You now know what gawp seed is, I presume? Well, Matty Charlesworth had a host of this kind of customers, from Springer Jack, the champion dancer, who would never own to his being forty, but insisted that time had given him up when he was thirty, down to the awkward, shambling hobbledy-hoy, who blushed when a razor was named, and took sly dubbings of his slender beard when he was sure no eyes were upon him. But no one, it was supposed, ever made an impression on Matty's heart, though Jack danced till he dropped through his stockings, and the hobbledy-hoy blushed till it was suspected he used paint. She appeared to be a downright candidate for the shelf, and might look forward to the cobwebs of old maid or gathering about her person. But to my story, one autumn Saturday evening, when the crops had been safely gathered, and the farmer, secure of his well-housed garner, no longer importuned the weather glass, but growled about the anticipated prices of produce, when the shopkeeper increased his stock of candles, and laid up his sun-blind till the return of summer, when the careful housewife began to complain of the increased consumption of coal, and looked well after the outgoings and incomings of her daughters, when boys could not pass a hedgerow without looking out a faggot for the November bonfire, when sweetheartless girls had begun to wonder if long evenings were more favourable to love-making than the fine summer twilight, that a comfortable and lively fender were gathered round the hearth of the jolly carter. If you have never seen one of these fenders, you will hardly understand me, but try to fancy to yourself a fire blazing up in the chimney, the glow from which lights up a semicircle of faces as no other light can, the man of the hob amusing himself with the poker, whilst his opposite neighbour, next the oven, has found a plaything in the tongs, and all the company are throwing back their heads and laughing in ready chorus as some joke is made or some story is progressing, and you may form as good an idea of what a fender really is as can possibly be obtained without actually seeing one. Well, this fender was enjoying itself so thoroughly that the cat could not help turning its back upon the fender proper and licking its whiskers as if it was sharing in the merriment. Matty Charlesworth was waiting on, and for once during the week was in as sweet a temper as any admirer could wish to see. Her face was as bright as the cans which hung from the ceiling, and whether her bedgown was a portion of the whitewashed wall, both always spotless, or was attached to her person, had to be decided when she came in front of some darker object. There was a change in Matty's personal appearance that no one could make out. Was her hair done up different to usual? Had she changed her necklace or earrings? 
Was there a loop more or less about the neck of her bedgown? Or had she washed her face in a solution of twinkles? The latter appeared the most probable, for, turn her head which way she would, some portion of her face was sure to be smiling at you. Gawk seed was at a premium. The unseasoned youngster who could not yet drink his ale without being fettled followed Matty's figure as she swept to the fire and wondered if there ever was such bright clogged bottles as those which were then lighting up fifty furnaces in his breast. The one who played with the poker hinted at the presence of a cinder somewhere about the bottom of her skirts and a smell of fire as the consequence. But had not Matty possessed the neatest ankle in the village, she might have been consumed there and then with shovelfuls of imaginary cinders, for aught he would have cared. He who found companionship in the tongues ceased making circles on the hearthstone and expressed an opinion that something was burning in the oven. Was it that he really thought so, or was it that the two tempting ringlets which hung over the temple nearest to him might touch his face as their owner bent down to loop. He never confessed he had no need, for the empty oven betrayed his motive, even if the jealous loops of the company had gone for nothing. Leaning his chair back against the dresser sat a peevish old bachelor of the name of Sam Briggs, but better known by his soubriquet of Sogger. This man, had professed to be in love with as many generations of young women as had grown up around him during the thirty years before, but he had never offered his hand to any one of them, till that hand had become too unsteady to aspire to other than widows, and those too of an uncertain age. These he allowed to slip past him till he was out of date even for them, and as the children had begun to call him Owd Sogger and Barfoot Yed, he had become bald or had grown through his hair, as some would have expressed themselves. It was time to give up the idea of matrimony altogether and make up his mind to remain a eunuch to the end of his days. He now entertained himself with making matches between other people or spoiling such as were made without his assistance, which latter was the more agreeable occupation of the two. You may feel certain his advice was often sought by the uninitiated of his own sex, and the wonder was often expressed that he had not, when younger, ran away with some heiress or other and made an excursion to that paradise of clandestine marriages, Gretna Green. Of course, he might have, had he not preferred bachelorhood. On this occasion it might have been observed that he plied his pipe more industriously than was usual, and that his head was constantly going into and coming out of a cloud of smoke, and that whenever his face was distinctly visible, his eye would strike you as being particularly luminous, as if borrowing its light from some project then kindling in his brain. It might have been observed also that he was remarkably taciturn. He had not yet told a single story for a wonder, nor even attempted to let off the most harmless of jokes. He was shut up within himself during a whole hour, with door locked and fast bolted. At length, with a sly lifting up of his windows, and a glance at Matty as she was elbowing her way towards the fire on an ale-warming excursion, he came out. Matty, he said, looking at the girl betwixt two looking irregular pillars of smoke. How is it thou's never begun a chapping yet? What's that you're saying, Sam? said Matty, without turning to her interrogator, as if the question did not interest her. How is it there's never begun a courting? Nobody's never asked me, that's how it is, was the ready and unexpected reply. The company stared at each other, then at Matty and at each other again. The girl, apparently unconscious that the matter was of such moment as to call for any further remark, tossed up the warmer on the chimney shelf and tripped back to the little bar. There seemed to be a general challenge flashing around the room, if Luke's might be regarded as its indication. Seats grew uneasy. The youth with the poker commenced scaling the fire as if he was raking out his feelings whilst he with the tongs tilted back in his chair and knocked his clogs together like one under the influence of St. Vitus. The merriment, which had been going on for a considerable length of time without flagging, fell off so suddenly 
They you might easily have imagined some accident had happened. Several of the company drank up their gills, with the evident intention of ordering fresh ones. Others, with pots before them that had been standing empty, appeared undecided as to whether they should not go shift their quarters, but at last gave in and that they were just a gill or half a pint short. One or two might have been observed casting significant glances towards the bear, where Matty was humming snatches of a love song popular at the time. All were bidding I for gawk seed, as if bent on purchasing at whatever cost. Sogger noticed these signs of an awakened interest, and his eyes kindled the brighter. The smoke from his pipe made denser clouds, and almost screened him from the observation of his companions. His mouth began to twitch nervously, and there was that in his whole demeanour that indicated a propensity to set as much mischief a-going as the opportunity could afford. Glancing at the fire as he spoke, so that his remarks might apply to anybody or everybody present, he observed, Lads are no same as they used to be. I've seen the time they'd have been after such as Matty like a pack of hounds, if who gave him such a challenge as who's gone now. But what can we expect out of folk that have been brought up with a taper and wearing dickies? Pinger, he said, turning to a youth who was trying to fix his cap so low on one side of his head as to display a large field of stubble on the other. If I'd the mackings of thee, I'd make better use of me tongue, nor thou does. But anybody that's fond of keeping pigeons, same as thou art, I'll never make much out of courting. Limber thy shanks up, mon, and go and buzz a great word or two in Matty's ear, that'll mack her to fly out of her skin. Oh, I see, I might as well talk to an empty pot as to thee, for anything that'll come out on thee. Let's try somebody else. And Sogger gave a glance round the room. If Pincher's face had been submitted to three or four coatings of cart paint, it could not have assumed a deeper red than was now spread over it. He could not look at any of his companions, whilst there was chaff in every eye that glanced at him and if Sogger's remark did not elicit the artist's laughter, it was because no one felt himself secure from being the subject of similar taunts. "'I'll tell thee what, Bowley,' said the peevish Briggs, turning to a fellow somewhat the senior of Pincher, and whose chin had evidently suffered from the harsh treatment of a borrowed razor, and consequently had been untouched for several days. If thou would not but mow that three weeks beard o' thine, thou happen mit stand a bit of a chance, but there's no woman ud tackle thee with that turf clod about thy face. Go and gid Twine a Joe a penny, and let him clear a road to thy mouth, and then come back, and let's see what Matty'll say about thee. I did year a say one day, a wonderful, if aught gradely chaps had gone across brook, for then no but Bowley and one or two more were fit to be looked at. I wish I were twenty years younger. I'd stir some on you up. There's Jamie old Tums yonder, he continued, motioning with his pipe towards the youth who had been playing with the tongs. He'll be getting as round-shouldered as our blutchery now. We hanging o'er gates, counting potato drills, instead of making better use of his time. There's about fifty wenches now in Meryton that had marched straight to church with anyone on you, and you I know the courage to pluck her to bedgowns. I say, well, tab me, or oh, I like thee, or out of that sort. Eh, hey, you're a numlock. Come. Thou stay thy pot foiled if thou nubber ushed, said Bowley, flinging a penny on the table. I now to shut thy mouth. Thou's been preaching now for to see who stand a jill for thee. Here, Matty, he sang out at the same time, giving a smart knock on the table. Bring Sogger a jill. Matty made her appearance much sooner than was expected, for Bowley was just in the act of airing a boast that he could hang his hat up in that coat in under a month when he felt the girl's skirts brushing against him. Had she been listening to all that had been said? What is it? she asked, placing her hand on Bowley's shoulder in such a familiar manner as to call forth jealous looks from other admirers.
Sogger wants his pot filling, replied Bowley, evidently confused at Matty's sudden appearance. And art thou going to pay? said Matty. Aye, thou was less sense than I thought thou art. Here, come this road, I want thee. And the girl took hold of Bowley's left ear with a strong intimation in her manner that if he did not wish his head to be disfigured, he had better follow. "'What has yon old barefoot yed been saying about me?' demanded Matty, as soon as she had landed her admirer in the bar. "'I know he's been saying summat.' Bowley was completely disconcerted at finding himself alone with Matty, and would have passed the matter over as a bit of banter, had not a ringing laugh coming from the taproom caused him to regard his situation in a more serious light. "'He's been saying now, particular,' replied Bowley, looking a lie all the time. I know better, so tell me. Well, he's been daring everyone on us for to speak to thee, admitted the youth, opening up a mine of courage that he did not think was in him. For to speak to me? How? said Matty. How? Why, in a courting sort of a way, has he dared thee? Bowley's knees began to shake and his heart to flutter. "'Aye, a bit,' he replied, catching a glance from Matty that he thought was encouraging. "'Did he say thou was soft?' "'Now, what was the young man to say to this? Nothing. "'He wished he was shaved. He wished he could utter a few grand words. "'He wished his arms did not feel so wooden, "'that they had been capable of winding themselves around the girl's waist, "'an imitation of Burns and his island Mary.' as delineated in the picture over the mantelpiece. But neither his beard nor his tongue nor his arms would condescend to help one jot to get him over the difficulty. What could he do but feel that he was soft? Well, he did mutter something, he knew not exactly what, and Matty did not catch its meaning, if indeed it had any. Seeing her admirer stand like one who hardly knew where he was, or what he was doing, Matty came to the rescue. Thou art soft, and you're all on your soft, but thee specially, she said, giving Bowley a look out of the corner of her eye that made him feel as though it were impossible to retreat now without doing or saying something desperate. Well, he said, screwing up his courage for a change, wilt have a walk with me? Why couldn't you ask me when I could have gone out? Thou sees how busy we are now and Matty toyed with her apron string, and looked as if she was sorry she could not accede to Bowley's request. "'Well, wilt go some neat house?' urged the latter, now grown as bold as Hector. Matty was silent for some moments, as if trying to remember what evening she would be most at liberty. At length, she said, I asked to go to Parsonage with Butter to nine o'clock, and if thou... What, to neat? Aye, to neat and if thou meet me on the fairy bridge. On the fairy bridge? And Bowley shuddered. Aye, I can go round that road, but be sure that thou gets there the first, for I dare not stop by myself. The fairy bridge lying at the bottom of a lonely dell, about half a mile from the Jolly Carter, was supposed to be haunted. Lovers never made appointments to meet there, and rarely passed the spot, unless in company with others on the same business. Many were the stories told of fairies being seen there, hanging on boughs of trees, turning somersaults on the bridge's railings, jumping over the brook on long slender poles, and indulging in other elfin pastimes. Besides, it had been the scene of a murder, a lover cutting his sweetheart's throat through jealousy and if a white fleecy cloud had swept over the sky on a calm moonlight evening, its folds resembling trailing garments, it was supposed by the superstitious to be associated with the spirit of the murdered victim which occasionally visited the spot. Bowley's air, short as it was, seemed to lift up his cap as he speculated on the perils of the assignation Matty had suggested. But faint heart never won fair lady, and as others might be tempted into taking his place, if he allowed a white feather to show itself in his plumage, he resolved for once to bid defiance to fairies, boggarts, and every other species of hobgoblin, and betake himself to the place of tryst at the time named in Matty's proposal. But stop, 
the eve of all hallows was approaching, the shadows of the other life which floats through the weird world might be rehearsing their mischievous orgies for their grand annual festival, and the bridge might be swarming with them at that moment. He scratched his head, reflected, and hesitated, but Matty's full eyes were beaming on him. There was more witchery in them than beaming in the whole of fairydom, and Bowley's pluck, called to its office by the look of encouragement that ought to have dissipated all kinds of fear, he took the girl's hand, pressed it clumsily, and faltered out, I'll be there. Thou no mack a fool on me, Wilter, said Matty. If I do, dunna swear, I'll take thy word. There's somebody knocking, I mun go. It's half past eight now. I'll see what the company wants, and then I'll be off with the butter. My grandmother, I'll have to wait on em while I'm away. If thou tells any of t'others about this, I'll never speak to thee again. Now then, oh, if wants a bus, thou mun wait, let me come. Matty pushed herself past her lover, and went to attend to her customers. She appeared as unconcerned when she entered the tap room, as if no assignation had been arranged or as if the fear of ghosts and fairies had never crossed her mind. Not so boldly. He appeared not to know what to do with his arms and legs when he went to resume his seat. His hands shook as he took up his pot to drink, and his face was as pale as death. When his companions asked what was up with him, he made no reply, but sat like one entrance, gazing at the fire. So engaged with the company in trying to fish out the cause of Bowley's changed appearance that they noted not the absence of another of their fraternity until the latter's return to his chair in about as absent a state of mind as his predecessor. Pinger had been away about ten minutes. Nobody knew whither he had gone or what was his errand, but if he had seen a ghost he could not have appeared more unmanned. His face was blanched. His hands trembled, and he sat upon his chair like one who is conscious of a powder mine having been driven beneath him. Presently, a light cloak, the hood hanging down behind, a silk handkerchief falling gracefully over it, flitted past the bar door, and in response to the next summons from the company, the old grandmother came tottering into the room. But where was Jamie O'Tums, and where Pincher? Where Bowley?